Thank you, Veronica. Well, welcome to this new session of our Forum of Recerca. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to present the, the two speakers we have today. Um, the two speakers are two political scientists, and they are la creme de la creme in Europe, uh, uh, Anja Neundorf and, uh, and Sergi Pardos Prado. So let me say a few words about, uh, about uh, our two speakers. Anja is professor of politics and research methods at the University of Glasgow, and her area of interest is comparative politics, uh, political behavior, and research methods. And she has published in the top journals in, in the field, in the American Journal of Political Science, Comparative Political Studies, the British Journal of Political Science, Perspectives on Politics, etc., 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 etc. And, um, and she is currently the holder of an uh, ERC Consolidator Grant. Um, Sergio Pardos Prado is professor of comparative politics at the University of Glasgow, um, and her, his area of research is political behavior, immigration, comparative politics, and not surprisingly, he has published in the best of the best, uh, in the top journals in political science, the American Journal of Political Science, the British Journal of Political Science, the European Journal of Political Research, etc., 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 and uh, at least in my view, Sergi has a very important um, point in his uh, CV. He's very active in terms of uh, knowledge transfer, and he's a member of the Migration Advisory Committee in the United Kingdom. And so um, he's showing us that apart from publishing and doing research, we, have, we should assume a very active role in terms of giving good advices to, to, to our politicians in order to make uh, the best uh, possible policies. So uh, um, last but not least, they are very nice guys, okay? <laughs> this is a very important thing in the academia, and they are good friends of many of us in the department. So remember that they are spending some time with us. They will be with us until May, if I'm not wrong. Please do not hesitate to, to contact them. Uh, they will be very happy to, to talk to you about your, your research projects. And uh, given that they have a so... As, uh, they are so successful in terms of applying and getting funding. I think that if you want to share with them uh, the possible applications you are preparing, possible research projects, please do not hesitate to, to, talk to, to talk to them. So thank you very much, uh, Annie and Sergi, for accepting the invitation to present your work. And the floor is yours. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lago, Nacho. Uh, you know, it's a, a delight to be here, to see you all, and to spend uh, a few months, uh, you know, uh, being part of this intellectual community. Um, uh, just a note on my policy advice role, I'm advising in a committee on immigration policy in the UK, and as you know, it's going very, very well. So, <laughs> so one thing is the advice you give, and the other thing is what uh, people want to listen to and, 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 and implement. But we can chat about it over coffee one day. <laughs> Today is a completely different uh, topic, uh, or not, maybe. Um, regional deprivation and political resentment. This is joint work with Anya, of course, uh, and also with Giovanni Facchini and Cecilia Testa, who are both economists at uh, the University of Nottingham. Two economists working with political scientists. You know, very peculiar people, but uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, here we are. And then the research question, I suppose, that uh, is motivating our uh, sort of work is whether regional economic deprivation uh, is behind political resentment, and if so, why? Okay? So the kind of debate and the kind of literature that we try to speak to and make a contribution um, is basically uh, sort of like uh, trying to explain why we observe an increasing regionalization of populist votes or anti-immigrant reactions and so on as a puzzle to be explained, right? So if we were giving this talk maybe 10 years ago, the big question was, well, why does country X have a very established anti-immigrant space and radical right party, and why does country B not? But in 2024, you know, this is not a relevant question anymore. These parties are almost everywhere. But we observe over the last decade a new phenomenon, which is a very surprising and very strong clustering at the subnational or sub-state level of these kind of narratives, of these kind of votes. No? So the question is, 
why is this happening and what are the effects of this regionalization of votes? And then, you know, some paradigmatic examples, of course, in the, in the Anglo-American world, you know, Brexit vote, we live in Great Britain now for a while, and we were discussing this with Nacho a few days ago, and, you know, the Anglo-American world is the paradigm of uh, geographical uh, sort of like inequalities, no? You live in a relatively well-off area, you cross a couple of roundabouts, and the world is completely different at all levels, no? And, uh, you know, Trump support, of course, very regionalized, but also beyond the Anglo-American world, this is a pattern that we see over and over across many continental European countries. No, we write here Le Pen, but there's many, many examples. Now, there's an emerging literature trying to tackle this, so it's impossible to give full justice to all the good work being produced in this area, but just in a minute, hopefully. Um, in our view, most immigration populism literature, looking at inequality, looking at these kind of disparities, focuses on the individual economic conditions, but there's this political geography component a little bit absent, right? However, those early sort of like pieces of work that are approaching this uh, sort of like political geography, original component, are looking at the following things. For example, uh, <laughs> Carreras and colleagues and Bros and colleagues look at this correlational analysis showing that economic decline of areas affected by globalization correlates in the long run with populist success. Some people like Rodriguez Posse and colleagues go as far as to say that interterritorial inequality is a more significant correlate of populism than interpersonal inequality. And also people concerned with attitudes towards the European Union or uh, EU trust, they actually show that regional wealth uh, growth is you know, a, a very important correlate behind these attitudes. No? And then I mentioned the EU as a paradigmatic sort of like um, uh, political body of uh, supranational integration, globalization, openness, and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, truly amazing work, to be honest, being produced in this, in this area, but we think there's still three fundamental gaps to be, to be addressed. Uh, the first one is that, you know, I just highlighted a few findings, but if you go through a proper literature review, uh, results are very disputed, yeah? So, for example, Mackay and colleagues say, yes, regional economic deprivation and inequalities are very, very important. This is a good old economic sort of like factor. But very recently, R. Zimmer and Berneman say, Look, it's true that there's a correlation there, but this doesn't go through economics, right? This is about national attachments, status, all sorts of place-based dynamics that are not about regional economic deprivation as such. No? So there is a lot of disparity. There's a lot of results. Difficult to reconcile, really. And uh, the second gap, but related to the first one, we believe that a big shortcoming is that previous research is mostly observational, right? So we correlate things with things, which is very important. But when studying all these geographic, sort of like regional components, uh, this can come with severe methodological caveats, no? One of them is compositional effects. What if region A is different from region B? Simply because the people living in region A are different. Perfectly legitimate explanation, but there's nothing really at the regional level. There's nothing really at the aggregate level. This is just a, an aggregation of individual circumstances. Maybe in this region, everybody's low educated, and in the other region, everybody's highly educated, and so on and so forth. No? Um, related to that, self-selection or sorting. We have incredibly good work in political science and neighboring disciplines showing us that people self-select into congruent, comfortable, uh, environments culturally, politically, and so on, right? So in this case, the direction of causality is the opposite. Your attitudes are pre-existing, and that determines the kind of context where you want to live in, rather than the other way around, no? Anyways, unobserved regional variables, ecological fallacies, you name it. We feel that there is a bit of an experimental uh, causal approach to be uh, applied to this regional puzzle. And then the third gap, is that even in the handful of pieces of research, really, really good research, trying to assess causality about what's going on at the regional level, we don't properly understand why. We think that there's a bit of an under-theorizing of uh, sort of like the causal mechanisms behind why is it that the circumstances in your more proximal environment really shape your attitudes beyond what's happening uh, to yourself individually, right? It's actually not so obvious why this proximal sociotropic perception should trump your, your, 
your, your individual circumstance, right? And then, for, exa for example, Colantone and Stanek uh, showed us that Brexit and a lot of, uh, you know, these uh, populist uh, movements are very much due to trade shocks. So, for example, in this region, they used to produce all these products that now we import cheaply from China. And then you clearly see uh, basically this, uh, this kind of phenomenon there. Fetzer doing also beautiful causal analysis, but focusing on austerity, uh, sort of fiscal adjustment, austerity, having an exogenous impact on, 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 on uh, sort of like populism votes. But there is, there is a tiny bit to be uh, filled in uh, there in terms of uh, theorizing. So this is not a mystery novel. I'm going to try to summarize everything we're going to tell you. <laughs> in the, it's not like at the end, and the butler was the killer. Now I'm going to tell you who's the killer, what was the weapon, in which room it happened. And then we're going to just unpack sort of like all the stuff that we try to summarize uh, later on, right? So what we do uh, empirically is to deploy a well-powered experiment in Great Britain where we manipulate the saliency of individual deprivation on the one hand and regional deprivation on the other. We believe this is where we can contribute to try to experimentally, exogenously disentangle both, one from the other. No? We're also going to look at the interaction, uh, uh, and I'm going to mention something uh, about this in a second. Now, what we find is that regional deprivation matters over and above individual deprivation. And in particular, the three outcomes that are most affected by this uh, effect are satisfaction with democracy, trust in government, and populism. So yes, we do see exogenous, important, strong effects of regional deprivation, completely net, completely disentangled from individual deprivation on uh, very important outcomes related to political backlash. But perhaps more interestingly, we actually, the, the second big finding we have for you today, I suppose, is that um, regional deprivation strongly moderates the relationship between individual circumstances and political backlash. So we have an unconditional direct effect, yes, but we also have a conditional effect. And the last sentence of the last bullet point is important. The poor in poor regions show high levels of political resentment than the poor in richer regions. The poor in richer regions, in terms of political attitudes, are indistinguishable from the rich. So what we find is that the context not only has an effect on its own for everybody on average, but it heavily conditions how you perceive yourself in relation to the politics of your place. So the politics of place matters enormously. The politics of place or the place where you're living seems to send you signals of how well you're actually doing, how important you are in that society, and how well you're going to be doing. Right. So this is the second finding that we're going to try to, to uh, elaborate on. Now, why is that the case? We unpack those causal mechanisms via mediation analysis. And essentially, what we find is that there's the two key causal mechanisms to explain that. Prospective economic perceptions and social status. Both matter a lot. So prospective economic uh, perceptions means that if, you li if you're poor, you're not doing very well. But you live in a region that is doing very well, you think your personal finances are actually going to be OK. So there's a bit of a spillover effect. Uh, you know, into your uh, egocentric perception. You're more optimistic, so to speak. Whereas the, the proper left behind area, so to speak, the people who are struggling in, in left behind areas, those are the ones that, that show very strong levels of political backlash. You know? So the left behind thesis is kind of confirmed, even if controversial, it's kind of confirmed in our experiment. And then social status. So uh, basically what happens with the poor in poor regions is that social status perceptions are heavily diminished, right? When you're not doing very well and nobody around you is doing very well, you think that, you don't, that your group doesn't matter too much in society, that, you know, that nobody cares, that you're forgotten, all, all of those social status kind of things. No? So implications. Uh, well, and this is for the Q&A, for all of you guys to absolutely destroy everything, uh, everything I'm saying. <laughs> but one potential implication is that theoretically these results blur this very canonical, classical distinction between sociotropic and egocentric motives, right? So as, 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 as many of you know, the economic voting literature has these two paradigms, the sociotropic voting, meaning you vote on the basis of whether your context is doing well, your country is doing well. And the egocentric paradigm says, no, actually, what matters is your pocketbook. Yeah? Uh, are your finances doing well or not? Well, our results show that actually, once you properly disentangle both, <laughs> they heavily condition one another in the sense that residential signaling is able to condition your own prospective economic expectations about your own finances. You think you're going to be doing well because your region is doing well, even if actually you're not doing that well. No? 
Um, then another thing that we kind of unpack is that the poor are particularly sensitive to the signals and spillovers of residential context, whereas the rich, the richest preferences are less uh, elastic, right? So they are more sort of like stable. The rich is very happy with the political system everywhere, in every region. Uh, the poor, uh, so, to, so to speak, um, you know, are more sensitive to the context. So the politics and economics of place matters. And if, you know, if, if we are to try to stretch a little bit into a policy implication, well, you're a policymaker investing regionally, you know, infrastructure, sort of like aggregate economic outputs, uh, productivity, all of those things. This can reduce political backlash in that place, even if you do not manage to change individual circumstances, right? So this is a summary of what's coming. Uh, and there's, it's more than a summary, right? So I already uh, articulated a bit the argument that, that we're going to try to present. And then in a minute before uh, sort of like Anya takes over, uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of words about the basic, to be honest, theoretical framework that we're using. No? And this theoretical framework is very well known, very classical established theory in political science and neighboring disciplines, which is relative deprivation theory. You know, I know it's a bit controversial as well, but we thought it was, a, it was a, a sensible sort of like benchmark, sensible starting point to articulate our empirical strategy. So no need perhaps to go into detail, but just to pick up one of the classical definitions by Walker and Pettigrew. So essentially the idea is that we compare ourselves to a reference category to another group, to some, somebody else. And if the result of this comparison is not good, you feel angry about the system, right? So just to, to you know, a bit of a Mickey Mouse explanation. So essentially, uh, individuals may feel deprived of some desirable thing relative to their own past, another person, person's group ideal, or some other social category. So our first hypothesis is going to be, well, political resentment will be higher the poorer a person or a region will be. Very, very basic. But then beyond this kind of like, sort of like perhaps more naive or more established sort of like uh, expectation, we also thought that this was a good opportunity to look at the interaction at what we call congruence or incongruence scenarios. What, a bit what I was saying before. What happens to, uh, let's say, a person uh, with relatively low levels of income vis-a-vis -vis the national average? What happens to this person in a well-performing context versus a poor-performing context? No? And to be honest, and we're very agnostic and we're very explicit about uh, sort of like this uh, in, in the paper, uh, the direction of causality can go in either way. No? Uh, for example, if you look at the, uh, let's say, upper left quadrant, uh, 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 a poor, let's say, household living in a poor region, well, there's reasons to expect increased political resentment because the situation is pretty dire and because the two things reinforce each other. But perhaps we thought, you know, there's an ex ante expectation that uh, even if the situation is dire, that community is very homogeneous. Social ties, social integration, um, ties of solidarity. Maybe that thing helps, you know, uh, to improve the relationship with the political system via a more canonical social capital mechanism, if you will, right? So anyways, we don't prove that hypothesis, but we thought, well, it's, it's, it's uh, sensible to ex ante articulate it. No? And then if you look at the upper right quadrant, what happens to the rich? Well, imagine that a rich uh, person uh, lives in a poor region, well, you know, uh, on the one hand, it's uh, plausible to expect increased political resentment because, you know, uh, there's inequalities, crime, high welfare bills, all of those things. But at the same time, the purchasing power of a rich person is even higher in a context where house prices are lower, where services are relatively cheap, where, you know what I mean? So there's also, there's always a bit of a social cohesion slash uh, purchasing power uh, economic sort of like um, uh, argument driving some of these ex ante relationships. I'm not going to go into detail, but just to say we've been testing all of this. Okay, so I'll leave it here. And even if we hate this Pimpinella kind of uh, <laughs> kind of like experiments uh, of presentation, that's exactly what we're going to do. And Anya will take over. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want the? Yeah. Just take it. We can. Clarifying question, yeah. The hypothesis could be attached to a different theory. Right? Yeah. So the relative deprivation theory requires a, an upward comparison. Mm -hmm. You're doing worse off. There's someone who's doing better than you who is proximal to you. Right? So H4 is perfect to test that theory. Are you going to talk about the different theories? Or as you said, you're kind of agnostic. 
and it's just going to see what you get. Well, we are now already know what you get. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. So it's true that relative deprivation is basically the comparison, and then your 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 uh, you know your your placement is below the <laughs> reference point. But we're also going to test the opposite. So we're going to give full justice to all the empirical sort of like uh, explanations. Okay. And I think you're right that there's some other theoretical addendums that I'm not going into detail behind this table, <laughs> but they are empirically wrong. And, and they would complicate the presentation, but you're totally right. Right. It's relative duration plus others. But I guess the, 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 the key thing is we compare people with a, a reference point, which is a national average. And then if you're below that national average or above that national average, your attitudes will change depending on things and these things. Right. The national average is perceptually hard to grasp for a person. Yeah. So this is why relative deprivation would say it has to be a perception that is proximal to you, like you are a poor person living in a rich neighborhood. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. But anyway, you, you, you've made it very clear that it's sort of agnostic, it's exploratory, but it's like, in a way, you're not giving in yourself enough credit, maybe mm. you do in the paper, for all the different theories that would go behind each of them, which are, you know, very interesting. Yeah. I think I think you're right, and yeah. and, I, and 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 this is why we're like, look, we cannot go into detail now yeah, about yeah. all the different theories in the, in the paper. And then one of the questions will be clarified with the empirical design. I think the kind of reference uh, point that we use, but excellent, good, excellent points. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, so my turn now. Just be happy that we're not doing ticker ticker, like you know, back and forth every slide or something. But uh, I'm just going to explain uh, the research design and uh, the main analysis, and then I'm turning over again. Um, so as Sergi has uh, outlined, we're interested in kind of political backlash, and um, we we kind of started out thinking about resentment um, as you know, kind of a like quite abstract concept, um, because we we kind of didn't want to just focus on specific things like populism or trust in government or something like this, but we really thought that there's different, you know, drivers why people might feel left behind or resentful of how society works for them. And so we, um, we decided to measure political resentment with these five different um, indicators. Um, three are, you know, kind of much more about the system itself. So we're asking this very abstract general question about support for the democratic system. Um, uh, but also more, you know, evaluative, performance-based um, democratic uh, kind of satisfaction, like how satisfied are they with the way democracy works in uh, in the UK, and then trust in government, um, you know, as government being kind of a main institution representing um, politics, uh, and, and the, the, you know, there's a lot of research kind of showing that these outcomes do matter for follow-up things, yeah, whether this is voting, um, turnout, these kind of things. Then we use an established uh, battery of um, uh, items related to populism. So this is really the kind of more definition of populism relating to the will of the people. Um, and then we have also several questions about anti-immigrant uh, anti attitudes. Um, so this is the outcomes. Um, and then how did we go about testing this ex experimentally? So we're interested in explaining political resentment. Um, and the key here is that we want to prime people about how well they do relative to other people and how well the locality where they live does compared to the rest of Great Britain. So what we did is in the pre-treatment questionnaire, we asked them uh, specific questions about their household. Um, so we asked their income, um, but also the composition of the household. So how many you know, adults and children live in your household? Um, and based on this information, we then could calculate um, the equalized household income uh, because it does matter whether you have like you know two adults having a, um, you know two incomes or whether you have like five children with that kind of two incomes, right? So that needs to be equalized to really get at the proper distribution of where people stand. And we also ask them the postcode uh, where they live. Um, and based on the postcode, we could then ascribe them to a specific local authority. There's about 390 in uh, Great Britain. Um, and so this is not like we use the term region. So this is also what Sergi kept, kept referring. This is just a term we use in the, um, that is used also in the literature. But what we mean here is a local authority. So for example, Glasgow is one local authority. Yeah? London has multiple local authorities because obviously it's a big city. Yeah? So just for you to understand that. 
once we had that information, then people were um, you know, using block randomization based on the income and the, uh, the regional um, uh, kind of um, uh, groups, like you know, low, middle, and high. Uh, we block randomized them into our different treatment groups, where we then primed them on um, you know, their kind of individual standing in, pro uh, in the population or their regional standing, or both. Um, so it, some people also kind of got uh, both. So let me just um, kind of give you a list of our treatments. There's um, uh, seven different treatments plus a control group that they didn't get anything, no information. They were just kind of taken directly to the outcome variables. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we're of course interested in comparing this control group to the treatment groups. Um, and here we have um, what we also try to do is, you know, in addition to thinking about kind of just exposing them to the actual um, position that they are, are you rich, are you poor, um, uh, giving them the objective information about their income or where they live. Uh, we also uh, try to see whether it matters more whether we give you that objective information or whether it is about you having your own assessment about your own uh, position. Yeah, so we, we have each of these treatments both as an objective information but also as a subjective information. So how did that look like? Here are the vignettes, um, uh, you know, kind of the information that we give people, like we will now provide you with information about inequality, so we did mention that directly, so also again that is a prime, right, to make that salient, uh, in the UK based on official statistics, um, and you know, these are kind of all based on um, ONS, the Office of National Statistics data and so on. And so we first explained them a bit, kind of the logic of um, uh, rankings. Yeah? So we tell them like, you know, the, the poorest household is at the bottom and has a P0. And the richest household is at the is at the top, which P100. And then we tell them what the national average is, which is at uh, 64. Yeah. Um, so that's the average. And then, you know, from this, we can say, you told us what your uh, household income is, um, and, uh, you know, you are here. Yeah. And so, uh, as you see, you know, kind of, uh, this is, for example, you know, like somebody's really rich. So this is a visual, you know, kind of prime, you're rich, you're doing well, you're at the top. Yeah, so it's, it's the information, it's the numbers, it's the visuals of being at the top or at the bottom. Um, you might think that this is quite complicated. Uh, we did uh, do a kind of um, a manipulation check or attention check to make sure that uh, we're not overwhelming our respondents. And so we asked them also, given this information, what percentage of households um, then earn more than you? So they had to do like, okay, so if you tell me I'm at the 99 percentile, so that's 1 percent that earns more. Yeah. And again, we see that even is a, for us a manipulation check, whether they understood the exercise, but it's also another prime. Right? Because it's like, okay, there's only 1% that is richer than me. Yeah? Or if you're at the bottom, there's like 90% that have more than me. Yeah? So it's part of the prime part of uh, our test. And it is incredible how well people do. Uh, so overwhelmingly, people get it right. Um, so uh, like it's all centered around zero with you know, big peak. Um, this is the subjective treatment, yeah? Remember, so we had the objective information that we got from uh, their household income and household composition, but we could, we also asked them in, in the kind of second treatment on this household um, treatment about where do you think you are, yeah? So this is a slightly different exercise. It's more kind of their own reflection um, about, uh, you know, kind of making more salient their own priors and so on. And so we had a slider that was a neutral um, in a kind of black tone, and then they had to take the slider to adjust it uh, where they think they are. And once they kind of settled on it, on, you know, it also turned green. And then again, we have that manipulation check. Interestingly, same thing. Uh, even if we don't tell them, you know, apparently they can at least do simple math in the UK. So that worked well. Um, what we then kind of do, as you already see in the treatments, right, we're not interested in levels. It's not about like how much do you earn, but it's about a ranking. And so we're using percentiles. Um, and we use that both for the individual household income 
but also for the regions. Um, so here, for example, you see our map of uh, Great Britain. So when we say Great Britain, that just means we excluded Northern Ireland. They're always a bit more complicated. Um, and so here you see that there's a few gray spots um, of some regions uh, where we didn't manage to recruit people. I mean, there's like the Shetland Islands and these kind of places. Unfortunately, there's a few in the north um, that is a bit of a shame that we didn't recruit people. But you basically see that kind of um, that ranking, yeah. So as you would expect, the south around London is the like kind of the, are the richest regions, and then generally, like you see these like darker dots, uh, that city. So there's a bit of that urban rural divide which we know about, yeah. So this is the information kind of that people see, yeah. So they they know where they live, and these these places are meaningful in terms of identities, but also in terms of public services and so on. This is where usually like the health authority sits, where welfare authorities sit and so on. Uh, so they really are meaningful. Uh, so if we tell them your local authority, we use the name, you know, is at that rank, um, that is something that they definitely understand and we prime them clearly on their place where they live and which manages um, a lot of public services. Um, okay, so that's kind of the setup. Uh, based on this, we you know, estimate a very simple model, which is just you know using our outcomes of interest. So we have these different uh, types, um, and we then interact um, whether somebody was in the treatment uh, and which of the treatments versus the control group, um, and then we ha we uh, use you know kind of their either individual income uh, percentile or their uh, local authority percentile to interact it with that uh, treatment. Um, and uh, also for the subjective one, we use the one that they indicated. Yeah, we use their subjective information. So the idea here is what we do experimentally is um, we, you know, kind of prime people to think about, um, you know, where they are in terms of individual egocentric uh, position, but also where they are as a collective at the region that uh, they live in. Um, and the idea is that in terms of distribution, you know, the control group would look really similar. And luckily we have, like, you know, perfect balance in our uh, uh, treatments, but it's just that for the treatment groups, we made them think about this. We made it salient. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're leveraging here, what the, what the experiment is about. Okay. So let me then show you the main results. Uh, maybe just like any clarification question before I go on uh, with the design or, um, no? Okay, we can come back to this, obviously. Okay, yeah. Um, I think... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, curious about the dependent variable. It's support for populist parties. Which parties have you selected? Is it the percentage, or it's just a binary variable, or...? Sorry, it's an index uh, okay. that are statements like, you know, the. The you know the people should you know kind of make the final decisions or policymakers should obey the will uh, the the will of the people. It's about populism as an idea uh, that is about kind of citizen-centered politics. And yeah, you're so asking that at the individual level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. To these individuals who participated in your experiment. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But it's about a populist idea, not about populist parties. Okay. And you asked this before or after the prompts? Uh, this is all about, you know, after. So uh, pre-treatment, we ask them about, you know, some other things as well, but main, we are most important is, of course, uh, their income and where they live. Then we prime them, or not, if they're under control, and then we ask the outcomes. They were randomized so that none of the, the, the order of the, 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 the variables was randomized so that we, they didn't kind of, we, we didn't favor one of them, you know, to be stronger, to come directly after the treatment. And then after the outcomes come the measurements in terms of mediation. Uh, that uh, Sergi will talk about in a minute. Yeah, so that's the design in terms of the flow of the experiment. Okay. Um, so let me show you the main results. Uh, what we do here is uh, you see the point estimates um, of um, uh, kind of the interaction. Yeah, so I'm showing you basically um, the, the gamma here. Yeah? Uh, so this is what we're most interested in, which is the interaction between being treated or not and where you stand. Yeah, uh, so this is the um, the the main effects um, that kind of measure. You know, we want to see kind of these being significant if it mattered that we prime people on on kind of their societal standing. Um, and what you see is that when we look at the you know kind of objective 
information. The, nothing seemed to have moved things on average. Yeah? But if we move to the subjective information, then we do see some uh, effects as we would expect them. So, so this is an interaction between being treated and then, you know, for example, how well you do um, with your own income, individual income. So, you know, kind of these first two things, for example, here, sorry, 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 uh, is if you are doing better, you're higher up in the income distribution, having primed you on this, you know, activated a more positive evaluation of uh, uh, British democracy, yeah? And at the same time, it reduced anti-immigrant attitudes. There's even kind of more, you know, stronger effects or more consistent effects when, when we prime people on how well their local authority is doing. Um, there again, we see positive effects on, you know, boosting the evaluation of the democratic system, but also reducing distrust in the government, reducing populism. And then uh, the first one is kind of borderline significant um, democratic preferences. I should probably say that even you know, kind of the main effects here are insignificant, but we do find, especially for the objective um, region treatment, that um, the treatment did work, again, as expected, similar picture as here, um, when we just look at this um, kind of uh, with the marginal effects. So among the poor, they did react also on average. It's just the average effect are uh, insignificant. And we will come back to this when we look at the interaction. So as said, you said... S sorry, Anya. Yeah. What is the range of the dependent variable? Uh, they are all standardized. So 0, 1. Yeah, okay. anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I, we'll come back to this because they obviously have uh, different ranges in you know, kind of how we measured it. But for these, uh, for these mm -hmm. models, we all standardize them. They're not zero one. No, they are standardized. Yes. No, they're, they're standardized as, um, sorry. Yeah. I guess you're focusing on the small numbers on the x-axis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they are very difficult to interpret because yeah. all variables are standardized. And we cannot tell you now the so magnitude. Six, but we're going to tell you the magnitude in the, in the next slide. It's a set transformation. Yeah. Maybe talk about the magnitude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so then the, oh, sorry, I probably need to kind of wrap yeah. things up. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, let me maybe focus just on one or two of these uh, that are also most interesting. So, you know, there was this question about, you know, what is going on here in terms of, you know, is there kind of a crossover effect between your individual standing in society and where you live? Um, so this is what we're trying to test here. This is the, the treatments where we prime people both on uh, where uh, they stand themselves and, and where their region is. Um, and then we, we report here the marginal effects um, for their region but for two different groups. The poor is the bottom 20% and the rich is the, is the, is the top 20%. Yeah? And what you see is that basically among the poor, the effects are really strong. We're talking about a 20% difference uh, between the control group and the treatment group um, among the poor who live in poor regions. But then the treatment becomes insignificant among the poor once we, 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 uh, we, we see these poor people living in kind of more affluent areas, yeah? Um, so this is kind of a, a, a feeling of, you know, backs, uh, um, you know, uh, supporting the idea of um, uh, congruence um, that people living in poor region, being poor, they're the ones most affected. Um, but we don't really see anything among the rich, yeah? So you see this is all overlapping um, confidence intervals, there's not mu much happening. Coming back to the question about uh, the effect size, it's actually massive. So this is the uh, outcome for uh, preference for democracy. Yeah? So it's a question, do you think democracy is the best form of government? That's a fundamental question. That's a strong commitment to say yes. Looking at, these are predicted values. So looking at this line here, which is the poor households uh, living in poor region, support for this statement is only about 30, a bit more than 30%. Yeah? But um, looking at uh, you know, kind of this slope, <laughs> It's really big. So poor people living in poor regions only say in you know, 34% or so, yes, democracy is best. If we then move to same people in terms of income, but we, they are living in a much richer uh, region, this goes up to 70%. Yeah, this is a massive effect um, and, and hopefully also answers kind of, and especially we're talking about an experiment here on priming, right? So it's really big. 
this is the biggest effect, but we do find similar patterns in terms of that is the poor reacting stronger in poor region also for democratic satisfaction and also distrust in government, where there is not much going on with the rich. Yeah? So this pattern uh, that I just showed you stays more or less the same. Um, so then the question is, why is this happening? What explains this? What's the mechanism? And then Sergio will go and talk a bit about this. Thank you. Last being Pinella moment, I promise, uh, in just a couple of minutes. So we promised at the beginning to say, well, is there an exogenous effect? We hope we showed yes. Uh, regions on average, especially in their subjective version, which is purely exogenous, um, had an average effect. And also we see a very strong conditional effect, right? So the poor in poor regions react differently than the poor in rich regions. This is what we have until now. Now the question is why? So we implemented a series of uh, average causal mediation analysis uh, trying to look at uh, the following potential explanations for that. No? So the first one is prospects of economic Mobility, I think mobility is wrong, sorry. Prospects of uh, economic prospects of your own financial situation. Are you going to be doing better or worse uh, next year? Prospects of unemployment, interpersonal trust, and social status. These are the four mediators we check. Two of them are purely economic, and, and two others are non economic. Um, and then, basically, the results point out to reduce economic prospects and social status as the key mediators, right? So as, as, uh, as, as, as you probably know, uh, this mediation analysis consists of three steps. First of all, we show that our treatment moved the mediators, so exposing people to these forms of inequality really had an effect on their perceptions of economic mobility, unemployment, uh, interpersonal trust and social, st uh, social status, or in this case, economic mobility and social status. And then we show that the mediator correlates with the outcome, and then we show significant average causal mediation effects. So essentially, if I could point you to one key result here in the upper line, this is the indirect <laughs> effect of, of adverse economic prospects. So once you think that your economic prospects are not going to be very good, that reduces democratic satisfaction, increases distrust in government, increases populist attitudes, and increases anti-immigrant attitudes. And then the second line, is the average causal mediation effect, to which extent our treatment had an effect on each of these outcomes via economic prospects? And the answer is yes. So uh, these uh, basically uh, economic prospects, adverse economic prospects, reduce democratic satisfaction, increase distrust in government, increase populism, and increase anti-immigrant attitude. So the upper, the three upper lines, so to speak, uh, and I know there is a lot of stuff going on, tell us that the effects that Dania showed you are due to economic perceptions. Then there's not much going on in the center of the table, but then status becomes insignificant once again. So finally, just to conclude, regional deprivation matters exogenously over and above individual circumstances. Subjective perceptions of deprivation have stronger effects than objective information, right? Even if both are experimentally manipulated, and even if these subjective perceptions correlate massively, what was that, 0.8, 0. 0.8, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these subjective perceptions correlate massively with reality. So people get it right. Mm -hmm. People do not misperceive, and we have a whole section on misperceptions. People don't get it wrong uh, on average. And, and this is a bit peculiar. We were not expecting this. But at the same time, the subjective treatments are stronger than the objective ones, which makes us think that the engagement, the emotional, let's say, engagement that, that, of putting yourself into a slider, the, pros, the cognitive processing that you do is a bit more consequential than if a couple of academics tell you, oh, this is where you stand, right? But anyways, both are so correlated that we cannot claim these are just random uh, wrong perceptions. Now, politics and economics of place heavily conditions individual circumstances and backlash. The results are driven by the poor, because as we said, the poor in poor regions are the ones articulating resentment, but the poor in rich regions don't, and in a way they are indistinguishable from the rich. And then in terms of mechanisms, worse prospective economic perceptions and social status seemed to matter. Policy implications, context matters, context and signals, and you can improve the politics of your country by improving places even if improving individual circumstances is a bit more difficult or takes more time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So we have about 40 minutes for the discussion. So let's open the floor to collect yes. comments from the audience, both yeah. uh, people here in person and people who are online. And remember that the people attending from home cannot hear anything unless you use a microphone. So I think, Javier, you were the first one. Javier, no one hears you too. Oh, yes, it's a very, I mean, this is not really a question. Can you explain again the mechanism, the mechanism of social status, how it works? Thank you. So uh, let me compartir pantalla once again. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you for asking this because I had to go too quick. Yeah. <laughs> so social status is uh, a, a question that we ask uh, okay. after this, which is like there are some groups that uh, are on top of society and there are some groups that are at the bottom. Okay. Where do you think you stand? And okay. then people are given a scale. Okay. This, we didn't invent that. I mean, I think this is a very imperfect uh, indicator, as, as, as perhaps many of us are thinking, but this has been used and validated in other research. This is very um, an item available in one of these famous cross-country um, sort of like uh, surveys. Was it CSES or one of those? Anyways, we use, we copy this. this. And then, uh, if I could elaborate a bit more on what happens with status as an indirect mechanism here in the, in the three last lines of this table. Mm -hmm. So essentially here what uh, we show you is that when you think that you have high status or your group high, high status, that increases democratic satisfaction, okay. that decreases distrust in government. It has no effect on populism or on democratic preferences, but it decreases anti-immigrant attitudes. So three out of five of our outcomes are affected by social status. And then, perhaps more crucially, the average causal mediation effect, which I can go into detail of the technicality behind it, but this is a measure of the indirect effect of our treatment on the outcome via social status. So it's significant for democratic satisfaction and distrust in government. Oh. So in other words, these experiments, these sliders, these rankings have an effect on these two outcomes via social status once you look at the poor in poor regions. Okay, okay thank you. And did you ask uh, to, the, to the people about the reason why they are poor? Hmm. Because I was thinking that maybe people, poor people in poor regions can think, it's not my fault. I mean, it's pretty clear. It's, everyone is poor here. But if you are poor in a rich region, then you can think, well, maybe it's because I've been unlucky, mm -hmm. but it's not, I mean, in a way, maybe it's my fault. Mm -hmm. So maybe, if you are asking about political resentment, I was thinking, well, poor people in rich, in rich region can blame themselves, so they cannot express this through political resentment, but in poor people in poor regions can think, well, it's not our fault, it's government faults, because everyone here in this region, not only me, is poor. So no, I, maybe it's just a, a silly question. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful point, uh, and, and we completely agree. And this is actually an argument, an argument which we try to rehearse. The, the, the bad news of my answer is we actually didn't ask directly, so we cannot fully prove that. However, even if the poor in the rich region thinks that is not, uh, you know, uh, is their fault and they cannot blame the political system, which is, which is an argument we rehearse in the paper, however, they're quite happy, you know, there's no, there's no uh, you know what I mean? So while, while I think you're completely right, there's no reason, even if there's no accountability, even if there's no political accountability mechanism there going on because they think it's their fault, they're nevertheless quite happy. There is no, why are they so happy, you know what I mean? So this is why, because even if they cannot blame the system, there's no reason to be uh, that happy either, but they are happy. And then we thought, well, the region sends some signal that is relevant. Hello, uh, sorry. Um, I had uh, one clarification question that I didn't understand and then one maybe more theoretical question. Uh, the clarification, so y I understand you explained how people are placing themselves on the slider when it's the individual treatment. Um, so that's, you know, where do you think you are in comparison to the, the nation, right? On the regional one, is the question where do you think you are in comparison with your region or is it where do you think your region is in comparison to the nation? Like, how does the re region one slider or question work? I didn't, I didn't quite understand that. That's my clarification question. 
Yeah, um, in the same way. Uh, so uh, sorry that I only we only me compared to my region or my region compared to the nation. Nation. My uh, region compared to the nation. Yeah. So we we it looked exactly the same. Sorry, I should have maybe put that as well. Uh, it looked exactly the same where we put uh, the national average GDP. Um, yeah. So here it says average household, and then we said average um, like national average. Yeah. But then it's me compared to my region, not my region compared to the nation. Is the latter. Okay. Sorry, I'm not I think sure. I'm not understanding, but it might just be me. Uh, so the, the, the region, so in, in this, the, 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 this treatment for the region is um, there is inequality in the UK. Some regions or local authorities are here. The poorest local authority yeah. is P0. The richest local authority is P100. Mm -hmm. You told us that you live in Blackpool, whatever, so the, we programmed it so that the name of yeah. the local authority would pop up. Uh, we, we should have shown this, sorry. Yeah. And then, uh, and this is the national yeah. UK, national UK average, and this is where your local authority stands. So it's exactly what you see, but where you see individual is uh, the, the, the regional. Okay, thank you, yeah, no, now I understand Oh, sorry, it. That's very clear. <laughs> it's a bit no, confusing. No, okay. <laughs> and then my other question is a little bit more uh, undercooked, um, but just thinking about what you you know your findings that poor people in poor regions um, are much more reactive to the in terms of the outcomes than poor people in rich regions, and I'm wondering if there's a way to see the actual condition of the regions, right? Because I'm imagining if I earn exactly what I earn today, but I live in Pedralbes, which is a very wealthy neighborhood of Barcelona, um, then well I, I won't use Pedralbes because the public transportation is terrible, right? But Let's say I live in a place with good public transportation versus living in a place with bad public transportation or with good services versus bad services. I mean, I think that would be kind of a very clear, this is the government's fault, right? So how is that being handled within your experiment? Thank you. Um, I mean, at the moment, we're just looking at kind of this relative ranking. Um, and I mean, we do have uh, you know some analysis uh, where we also look at, I mean, you know, maybe it, I'm not sure how helpful this is now, um, but um, no, we do. Oh, you didn't bring the. I oh, know. Sorry, we don't have the. We do have. We, we have some analysis where we looked at kind of uh, some characteristics about the regions um, uh, in terms of economic output, uh, labor market, these kind of things, um, in kind of to explain the ranking. Uh, but uh, because we also wanted to understand what potentially drives misperception. Uh, so, uh, so this is in, in that context we did the analysis. Like, is there something systematic that people over or underestimate um, the actual standing? And the same with the region. Um, so, but in the um, in the treatment, it's kind of a, compo a compositional treatment, right? We just tell them your region is doing well or doing badly, right? And in a way, we then, uh, you know, what we're triggering here is that that might kind of, these kind of uh, considerations is what people then think about. Yeah, I know my region is doing badly because transport doesn't work and the schools are not really good. So, you know, but we didn't kind of look into specific things then, but we, we, there is a systematic explanation, of course, that uh, yeah, these kind of public services, uh, labor market conditions are different depending on how, how well the region does. We have house prices as well, yeah. but unfortunately we didn't capture them. The, it's notoriously difficult to find a reliable, valid indicator of that infrastructural uh, transportation thing. We had it in mind, but we don't have it, which is a pity. Me? I think it's me. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Thank you so. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Annie and and, and Sergi. Uh, I think I think this is a very good example of very well crafted design and thought uh, research. So so congratulations on that front. Um, I have four different points. So the first one is theoretical. It has to do with something that that uh, because of Sergi talking uh, on a site sort of like way about the theory. I thought about it, which has to do with the context. So. Um, these, these places might have different compositions, but they might have different contexts as well. Uh, so you might have like a middle class neighborhood that are like two middle class neighborhoods or two poor neighborhoods. They have the same composition, but in one of them, uh, it's a more of a dangerous area, and the other one, it's like a vibrant community with uh, you know associations and so on. So um, I was wondering whether there is any way you can capture that either at the aggregate or at the individual level. Although I have some idea for you later on, uh, but it's it's a theoretical concern that uh, at least uh, I missed in the 
the first part of the, of the presentation. The second point is that whether you can do a little bit more um, on, or sophisticate a little bit more the dichotomy between poor and rich. Um, for example, I was thinking about the middle class um, and this idea that the middle class is losing uh, power in some places in the UK and disappearing and so on. And then on two other groups, which are uh, the, the, the ones that are wealthy but are not wealthy enough to be super wealthy and might be a little bit frustrated or have different aspirations, and the poorest and the poor guys that are not super poor uh, to belong to the poorest category. Uh, so that this could be, these groups could be interesting by themselves to, to look at. But I don't know whether you have a statistical power for that. Um, the, I was thinking quite a lot about uh, why is it that the poor in rich regions behave differently or have different things. So one thing that could be related to the perception of fairness, um, that's one factor, factor. And I think you have fairness or something like that or in, the, in the survey, so you could try to see that. You, uh, the explanation would be something like, oh, I'm poor in a rich region, but uh, in two years I'll be like them, right? Because I know how they work and so on. This could be one. The other one is more contextual. So I'm poor, I'm stuck in, a, in Pedralbes, in a very wealthy region, but at least I can enjoy the, the positive spillover effects of, uh, of a wealthy neighborhood. So public transport goes well, the crime is low, and so on. So maybe you want to disentangle this a little, a little bit more, uh, which I find fascinating. Um, yeah, I had four, but actually I had three, so yeah, thank you so much. Well, excellent, excellent points, as, uh, as one would expect. Uh, and then, uh, so basically, the first one, I must admit, the first point, so just to clarify, are, are you saying that perhaps there's two regions that look the same in the economic continuum, but they are different in terms of social capital, how vibrant they are? Right. Um, so, so, no, no, I think it's very, very plausible. I'm just trying to figure out how exactly would that sort of like um, bias our results, no? So if, if it is true that there is that heterogeneity uh, within uh, an economic centile, and that was really driving the effect, this would water down our results quite a bit, no? So there would be massive attenuation bias. This would make our results very conservative, unless I'm, I'm, I'm misinterpreting. Um, and... And then the problem would be the opposite, actually. The problem would be, what if the rich regions are the socially capital vibrant regions and the poor regions are not? Then maybe I'm, we're telling you an economic story and it's not, right? Maybe that's, that's actually where your uh, perhaps criticism could, could, could play a role. Um, but at the same time, our experiment is so, you know what I mean? So it's true that in these survey experiments, what if people are thinking of something else that is not what you're priming, but you know what I mean? Our experiment tried to be quite clear with, with the economic rankings rather than anything else. Yeah, I mean, maybe something you know, to say is the scope conditions, right? I mean, this is, there's all kind of things that could go, uh, you know, that makes regions different as you know yourself very much, you know, kind of with your experience uh, here in Spain. This is an economic story, yeah? So here we focus on the eco economics of it. It's about your income, of the money you have in your bank account as a family, and uh, the the you know it's the local GDP, right? Like what as a kind of local unit is produced, and of course the idea is you know that spills then over into public taxes and then public spending and these kind of things. Um, but uh, yeah, that's maybe the scope condition that th there could be all kind of other factors why regions are unequal uh, because there is another richness that we don't capture with these uh, quite you know. Uh, economic factors, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, the middle class argument, absolutely. So we have a section of robustness checks with non-linearities that maybe was too much to present now. To, exactly trying to see whether uh, poor, middle poor, middle, middle rich and rich behave differently because what we showed you, you know, is constraining everything to a linear predictor. And everything is driven by the poor in the poor region. So the, the left behind story was was uh, was again was again uh, showing up. Uh, you're right. The statistical power was a bit more shaky, uh, and then lots of wide confidence intervals, very convoluted graphs, not a very clear story. But but we tried because we thought um, we thought the same actually. Maybe there's a non-linear thing, and then the fairness thing. Excellent point, and and uh, we can try this one. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this is one of the points we're making, uh, excellent uh, points all along from, from everybody. And this is homework that we have for, for this afternoon. 
and then related to perhaps why the poor in rich regions, maybe they're happier with the, so the spillover uh, in terms of infrastructure. That's kind of our argument, right? That, that, that's kind of what we argue. However, there is a limit to what we can show in terms of is this the bus stop? Is this the, the, the results, the, the um, streets are clean? Is it that there's no crime? You know what I mean? There's all sorts of things that could be happening and we admit that all of those things could be happening. But there's a limit to what we can show. I got it here. Um, I, I also like to echo like the nice design you've uh, kind of set up here and to kind of parse out certain things that are in dispute in the literature. Um, the one uh, question maybe it's c taking away from the economic again, but uh, the one literature I saw that was kind of missing there, to I know you mentioned you didn't include all, but the horizontal inequality literature, which, you know, again shifted the focus from uh, difference between individuals to difference between groups. Now here you're taking the region as a basis, but have you considered competing it with other sources of identity? Because to me, a lot of this backlash, and that's another point I was gonna make, backlash, resentment, and populism, you use it interchangeably throughout, but perhaps these concepts are not all the same. But let's say, uh, let's take backlash, or what people called white lash in you know, United States. There's a l big cultural dynamic to this, so how does culture play into these perceptions of difference and uh, perhaps uh, other sorts of allegiances that these individuals have? Which was my other question is, what do you control for on the individual level that, must, that might muddy this association? Membership in civil society organizations, race, religion, uh, right? Extended social network. Are they seeing a therapist, <laughs> right? There's, ma there's many factors that might also ex explain uh, the reactiveness to your prompts, or that, would, that might mitigate the reactiveness to the, uh, to the prompts. But yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that. Those were the kind of the two questions I had. Yeah. Um, I mean, to the last question, uh, of course, you know, it's, um, the, it's an experimental setup, right? So the, the assumption is um, that these kind of um, individual traits that might affect how one reacts to these prompts is equally distributed between the control group and the treatment group. And so uh, what we then see is kind of the net reaction. Yeah. So there would be some groups... Oh yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, we, we don't have like maybe that fine-tuned uh, variables that you say, but um, Unfortunately, I don't think we have a slide on uh, the balance, but we have really good balance uh, between our treatments uh, and the control group, so all the different treatments. So uh, that's kind of a key assumption here, right? Uh, um, but yeah, so how does culture come in here? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it would go beyond the scope of the uh, paper to look at other types of, um, you know, kind of groupings that, you know, feel resentment, whether this is specific social groups, religious groups, these kind of things. The focus here is on locality. Uh, but absolutely, you could easily, rep you know, replicate that. You need kind of some form of data to know maybe the social standing or economic standing of these different groups, but you could take our design and, and you know, replicate it for other, um, uh, you know, inequalities and so on. Um, we don't focus more precisely on cultural identities uh, here. It really is, like, as I said, and we should probably make that also clear in the paper, a scope condition is it's about economics. And maybe this is what happens when you, you know, team up with two economists. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, uh, we do have an outcome about anti-immigrant attitudes, right? Because it does, when we talk about resentment, th there is a kind of pathway of blame shifting uh, that is really important to understand these dynamics, yeah? where uh, we, you know, certain political actors and so on, you know, use a narrative about um, groups such as migrants, you know, that are all at fault of why things are, you know, you know, not working out. And uh, so this is why we added that outcome because it's so important, um, especially also in the British context. Uh, so, and because, you know, I said you ended up as, an <laughs> like, I want something with immigration. Um, so, but yeah, that's kind of the limit of, uh, of what we have in terms of culture in, in that way. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to add? Hi, Anja. Yeah. 
Anja and Sergi, yeah, again, congratulations to the, to the very sophisticated research design, and I really enjoyed it. My first question is, I was wondering how you arrived at these five dimensions of political resentment. Because if I look at them through Albert Hirschman's lens of exit voice and loyalty, I mean, you do an excellent job in capturing yeah, the distinction between voice and loyalty by looking at yeah, distrust in, gov in government, um, dissatisfaction with democracy. But when you think about regions, at least coming here from Catalonia, another form of political resentment is exit and wanting to leave. And I think this also plays a role in the UK. Yeah? An option or an expression of political resentment in Scotland is to wanting to leave the UK. And so why is this not in there? Also because this kind of cuts off from you from the literature on the economic, social economic drivers of successionism. And, and there exists a large body of work, which in a way, which often kind of flies in the face of your, your, your hypotheses. So that's my, my first question. And the second is I was wondering about the, the everyday meaningfulness of, of local authorities in the UK. Sure, I can, I can see yeah, that being from Manchester or being from a particular, yeah, this might have, but when I, what I remember from my time in the UK is what really, what matters is the regional distinction between South and North and Wales and, and Scotland. And so I was wondering to what extent if you were to move up to that unit of analysis, your um, results would be replicable or not. Thank you. E excellent point. Thank you. Um, so um, why, f why those five dimensions of political resentment? I think you're right that uh, we try to be ambitious and encompassing, but there's many others probably that we miss. And at some point there was a bit of a limit in, um, uh, in, in, in how many, right? So to be honest, we, we were just trying to speak to the literature on populism, radical right, anti-immigrant attitudes that focuses on these typical outcomes. And then we felt, even if you're completely right, that there's an exit option that is completely missing, but we felt that the national identity, or in this case, the session literature, was a slightly slightly beyond um, um, what we wanted to study. You know? So for example, neither the ideology, nor the demographics, nor the voter profile of secessionist parties is overlapping. Sometimes it's even a mirror image of populist radical right narrative. So while an interesting outcome, the process, the mechanisms, the literature are, are so different that in the end, uh, perhaps mistakenly, we, we, we left it out. Um, what we do is actually, in relation to the second question, we try to show that um, these uh, regional slash national specificities do not drive our results. So our results are consistent once you add the Scottish dummy, the Welsh dummy, and the English uh, and the English dummy. So, uh, in, in that's that's what we can say about that. Uh, and then we felt that um, that was more just as a con ju just to show. Look, this is not driven by the center periphery conflict, rather than engaging with yet another literature on center periphery conflicts, which is super interesting. But but we thought, well, I'm not sure that feeds into a single paper, no. But again, uh, this is not to say you're wrong. I think that uh, that, that that just what we did, no. But I would also say that um, the local authority unit is quite important in the UK. Uh, I think that, um, you know, first of all, there is like public services uh, that are directly attached to that particular level. Um, so, you know, it's the Glasgow City Council that, you know, collects our trash and, you know, is in charge of transport and these kind of things. And, or like in London, you know, you have like the boroughs that are kind of mostly kind of overlapping with these local authorities. So they are meaningful um, when it comes especially to what we are trying to trigger, which is to think about, you know, the place and the opportunities it provides to people. Um, so I think it does make more sense to kind of leave it at that level. Um, so yeah, but may, it's, it's an important point. I think that really uh, the, the justification of why this level or not this, why not lower, right? I mean, Sergi started out motivating the paper saying, talking about roundabouts, which there are many in the UK. Uh, I mean, they're obsessed with roundabouts. And it's true, you know, I mean, we live in Glasgow. It's a, such an unequal uh, city. Uh, you, it really feels sometimes like this, that you cross a, a couple of roundabouts and you're in a different world. So why not neighborhoods? Yeah? But of course, then it becomes more difficult um, to, to get data. But also, 
there is something beyond that, right? It's not the neighborhood that makes these kind of important public services, uh, it provides these, right? So this is why we kind of then came to that level. Yeah. But it's a fair question. What is the, what's the region? What is your local you know, identity? Um, yeah. So I'm handing the microphone in the order to see the hands being raised. It's, it's a visual test, it's a visual memory, but uh, there's many hands still, and uh, I will ask, please, if you could phrase your question in a, in a short way, that way you all have a chance, and if you don't uh, remember, the speakers will be happy to talk to you. Um, so I think you're next. Thank you. Uh, I think now we have talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to ask you um, specifically um, about uh, the, me the causal mechanism of how these um, poor people in which regions uh, uh, have these different attitudes uh, towards democracy and, and so on. Uh, and we have talked about uh, public services, public transportation, but specifically how uh, the role of um, mm, some policies that address the poverty in those regions, how this could affect the, these attitudes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm sure you have thought about it, uh, but this specifically this, this question. Uh, and if you have thought about introducing this possibility in your causal mechanism, because uh, I think that in general, uh, social status and perspective economics perceptions are important, but also uh, the, um, the conditions of these poor people in those regions that could be addressed by, by public policies. I thought we were collecting, sorry. Um, well, excellent point. Uh, we actually thought much less than, than you about this point, <laughs> in the sense that it's, a, it's an excellent <laughs> point, another, another bullet point in the, in the homework to-do list. Um, now, I guess we're gonna open up also a can of worms in the sense that there's also the social policies addressing potential uh, issues. Now, all, all the story about cash transfers, welfare benefits, redistribution, this is all quite centralized at uh, the UK level. So that would not fit the scope, but in a way, um, maybe that, that, that can help us and that can, uh, we're ruling out something that is actually not local uh, based on your, but there's other things that fit your, what you're saying that we don't look at. For example, I'm thinking of the quality of the healthcare provision, mm -hmm. even if Right? Even if the NHS is, uh, the National Health Service is a very famous single national institution, but now it's very, devo it really depends on where you live and you can be super lucky and super unlucky because lo local authorities manage the budget and manage it. So things like that, there's more to think about. But, but all the, I'm not sure if you were thinking of redistributive policies in terms of cash transfers and, you know, um, how did they call it, the universal credit policies, all of those are at the national level. So I don't think they would bias. But if we go back to the social services, the infrastructure, the transportation, maybe healthcare, that uh, could be part of the explanation. We don't deny it, we just struggle to disentangle it. Thank you, Sergiana. It was a pleasure hearing you. And <clears throat> as Tony said, this is a very well well designed and very well performed research. Uh, I have a, a general comment on the theoretical framework that has already been uh, mentioned. Uh, I was thinking all the time about Martha Nussbaum's book on uh, resentment and anger. And I miss in your theoretical framework, maybe you do that in the paper, uh, a broader reflection on, on, on the connection between emotions and justice. Uh, if you look at your findings and, and your robust um, research through the prism of justice and, and emotions, uh, you realize that there is, behind that, there is a narrative on on fairness, as Tony said before, and on how you perceive uh, that, you, that you are treated in the end, eh? if you are treated justly or unjustly. Um, this might affect, um, um, first, the causal mechanism, depending on the causes of your resentment, on the specific conditions of your region economic, what happened there, uh, might have a, a, a totally different impact on how, of if you perceive that this is just or unjust. If they close the mine, if you lost your job because uh, of um, in, um, artificial intelligence, whatever, right? Depending on the cause, you might be more or less. But most importantly, it also affects the interpretation, and that's my point of view, eh? we can discuss that, but the interpretation of your dependent variable. You have a continuous variable here, but if we look at the theory, 
I'm not an expert on that, but there is a huge political difference between resentment and anger. And and you are, as you said at the beginning, you are worried about populism and far right and these movements, and these movements, in the end, are about anger, not only resentment. And and my point here is is I see a discontinuity here, a categorical difference, a qualitative difference between feeling resentment, political resentment, and being totally disconnected and totally angry with the system. And, and I think that this could be, I don't dare uh, to challenge your, your, your research design, but uh, this could help you to, 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 to shed light on, on, on the results, on the findings, eh? and the difference between resentment and, and anger. Thank you. No, yeah. Uh, well, excellent points all along, to be honest. Um, so I suppose that so the, the connection you make between emotions and justice connected to the fairness uh, point that Tony was making, I think you guys are, are really uh, sort of like getting into something very important. And we do have the possibility to explore these feelings of justice, and this is something we're going to do. Uh, now, we're going to be a bit more limited in uh, exploring emotions. Um, uh, which is a pity, but we don't have measures of anger, or whatever. We can, we can, so basically, we discuss them in passing, a little bit too in passing, when trying to make sense of why the subjective treatments uh, are, are, are more powerful than the objective treatments, um, uh, even if both are correlated, even if this is not a story of misperceptions or getting it wrong, but this is a story about how it feels, which is exactly what you're saying. Now, unfortunately, you know, I wish I could rewind uh, <laughs> and redo the experiment, adding all this battery of questions. We're not going to be able to do that, but they're going to have a space in the discussion on, on the interpretation of the results, so spot on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, I joined my colleagues in saying this is such an important study, uh, and I was really happy to see um, to see it being done. I have two comments. I will try to be very brief. Uh, they will sound a bit technical and dry, but uh, I was curious about your thoughts on on on, uh, on, on on this question. So, my first, so the distinction between the poor and the rich is is central in in your argument, um, but this variable is the moderator, right? So it's endogenous. It's not uh, randomly assigned, just the treatment is randomly assigned. Um, I was wondering if you have tried or maybe plan on trying the causal moderation analysis to, to try and see if other, if actually somehow kind of proxying, manipulating this distinction between poor and rich uh, has an impact on the outcome, right? So basically uh, balancing uh, the control and the treatment group to some propensity score matching to see if the treatment is still significant in in this uh, in this sample because it it brings me to the second to the, to the follow up to this uh, first uh, comment your mechanists presumably connect the treatment to the outcome but I I was reading them more as connecting the moderator with the outcome so I was wondering if you have a thought on on, on this causal diagram uh, in a way uh, behind your your model. And the second uh, comment is, uh, is linked to this idea of political resentment. Um, I, I am convinced by the measures you're using, but I am, it, seems, it seems that there are some differences uh, in the empirical analysis um, across different measures. Uh, I was wondering what implications this might have for you know, the overall concept of political resentment, which is much more multidimensional, as you, as you in indicated at the beginning, and whether um, this is just um, a bit the beginning of unpacking exactly what political resentment me, uh, implies and, and the, uh, the dynamics behind. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, um, like, thanks for the uh, you know, suggestions. Um, I think we, we really have to kind of uh, dig a bit deeper. There are, of course, limitations, you know, what we can do. Um, I'm not sure whether, you know, kind of the matching uh, beyond what we're doing now, you know, will will really help us. I'm not, I'm not sure because in a way that you know the assumption is that they are matched, right? Uh, if you have balance, you know, there should be. If you have proper randomization, the, the you know the control group, you know, with all the other things that we're not measuring, they should look quite similar to the treatment group, the moderators. Um, 
I'm not sure that may so the moderators um, to which which yeah. mother mo the, so what do you uh, moderator in t in the terms of income for example or right okay yeah yeah so she means okay maybe we need to we need to pick this up um, yeah and then you know the uh, I mean the the concept of political sentiment I mean you always are, you know, wiser, and you know, afterwards, right? And you kind of regret uh, once you've done it. You know, why didn't we include measures on emotions? You know, why didn't we, like, you know, put something about kind of maybe uh, turnout or you know, something like you know what Matthias was suggesting about right, uh, exit? Um, but uh, yeah, it's it is a bit of a it, you know it's a bit of a mix to be honest, also of our interest, right? So I'm more interested in you know support for democracy. That's a quite abstract kind of more systematic. I don't care know. about democracy at all. <laughs> <laughs> He wants all immigration, you know. Uh, so uh, it, it does reflect a bit, you know. There is, of course, you know, we, we know from the literature that these, um, you know, indicators, these, you know, kind of sentiments, they are all connected to the outcomes, you know, that we usually, you know, that worry us, right? That's, uh, and so this is where we kind of try to, to get a bit of a breath and rather than just zooming in on one particular aspect, it's just to kind of give a bit of breath. Um, we don't, you know, it's difficult to interpret, like, why does, like, you know, in some models this outcome work better and then in others, there seems to be something quite systematic in terms of satisfaction with democracy, uh, which you know it's it's a strong indicator that lies kind of in the middle of the range. It's not as abstract of just general support for democracy. It's really an evaluation of the system. Does it work uh, for you? Um, and so that seems to be kind of most systematic in terms of uh, its effects. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult sometimes to interpret like why you know. You know, doesn't this work and, and this works and so on? Um, and it might just be that they trigger slightly different, you know, kind of um, aspects of inequality that is, is also difficult to look into. So there's definitely need for more follow up to really kind of try to zoom in better. What is it? Uh, I think it was important to first establish that place matters causally um, for especially the poor. Um, and now I think, you know, hopefully there will be, you know, us or other people, you know, feel motivated by then trying to open this even further. Um, yeah. If there's more questions, should we collect them? Yeah. 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 Yes, it's working. Um, thank you very much. It was uh, absolutely fascinating uh, to to hear and elucidating. Um, I just had one quick question out of curiosity. If you go back to the table with the me uh, with the mediation analyses, yeah, I found it striking that um, one of the most you know, striking results, which is the massive decrease in democratic support, and not only democratic satisfaction, but the democratic support um, effect that you found, that it doesn't seem to be explained by the mediation analysis. So I was, w I was wondering if you have any speculations as to, as to the causal mechanisms underlying this relationship. That's all. Uh, very quickly, uh, two points about the paper. Um, the first one is that um, uh, um, I think that you should change a little bit the setup of the paper. Because you talk at the, at the very beginning about the economic decline and this idea of the left behind places. But this idea means that there has been a change or a trend. Mm -hmm. And in your treatment, you are not including change. So I would drop this idea, because you are not doing exactly what you argued at the very beginning. Um, and the second thing, I think that it's crucial the idea of decentralization, as Matthias was suggesting. I mean, regions are crucial in, in some countries. It's not the same being in Portugal, in the Alentejo, than in Germany, for instance. So when people, uh, the question about trust in government, well, I think that I'm not sure if you are analyzing trust in the national government or in the regional government. But if the country is highly decentralized, maybe people are happy with the national government, but not with the regional one. And this point is important both for the dependent variable and also for uh, whether your findings can travel to other countries. So at least in the conclusions, I would say something about that. And I have more comments, but we can talk about uh, the, 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 the lunch. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I guess all of you want to have lunch, so just very briefly. Uh, thanks very much uh, for, for that comment. Spot on. I wish we had a good answer. <laughs> so one of the strongest uh, effect magnitudes is not fully explained by our mediators. We have fairness and justice to explore. M there might be something else going on. It's, it's true. The mediation analysis doesn't seem to pick up that. So another point in the to-do list. Um, so uh, Nacho, thanks very much. The, the treat, so the setup, maybe, maybe um, I, I confuse you guys in the, in the presentation about the economic decline because I was citing previous research talking about it. We do not imply any longitudinal temporal variation. So we're not interested in that. We're just looking at the snapshot, whether this snapshot has been coming along over the last 10 years or whether it's today's snapshot, that's just our interest. But I think you're right, we need to be more careful with the wording. I think we're more careful in the paper than, mm. what, I mean, than in uh, the presentation. We should probably say that uh, we have one uh, treatment uh, for on the kind of regional level, which is not about like what is your GDP ranking, but, but it's about growth. So uh, we do have that. Uh, we because, have an extra. Yeah, yeah. It, it was an, you know, it, there is a, a, a bit of a tension also in the literature. Is it about levels or about uh, development um, and, uh, and growth? And so, yeah. Um, and we didn't find uh, a anything. different thing. Uh, yeah, and it, might, be it yeah. might be just an artifact of our experiment or whatever, but we don't see that this is decline versus current conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the results were the same, but we have an extra there. And, and, and spot on, I don't think decentralization is biasing our results because we deliberately picked a uh, relatively heavily centralized country in some core aspects that we look at. But of course, this has implications for the external validity. You know? How does this travel to Germany, yeah. uh, to Spain? Or, and then uh, we, we need a sentence or two there. Uh, and I think the, the question about national government, uh, the, the uh, tr distrust in government is about the government investments. I think we even put that, So, uh, which is obviously, you know, living in Scotland, you're aware of that question that the government is, you know, could be too different. But yeah, no, this is the national government. Okay, so thank you so much for this uh, great, uh, this friendly and constructive and funny uh, uh, presentation and discussion. So hope to see you soon here, soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.